usual Monday pieces, but we, Jordan, I'll go ahead and uh, give, a, give you a second to get this ready. We have got to begin with the many, many updates to our coaching carousel. All right, so it's the middle of the night. I said, honey, pack your bags. Got the PJ waiting. Taking off in the middle of the night. And look, Bud and I sat down for an emergency podcast for Mike Elko to Texas A&M. We had enough to believe that we were going to be headed in that direction. And as Bud said on the Instant Reaction pod, um, <clears throat> it would be hilarious if it didn't happen because then we've got a whole other saga on our hands. But as of Monday morning, Texas A&M makes it official. Elko will be introduced uh, a little bit later on today at a press conference. So, Tom, you you mentioned something before the show. I don't want to spoil your take, but good hire, strange process. Elaborate on where you are with Texas A&M now that it has its replacement for Jimbo Fisher. Not a strange process, a bad process. Bad, bad process, process good result. Adjective. Yeah, bad but, process, um, good result. Yeah, leaking – Leaking Stoops and then having that backfire on you, whether that was a and revolt, Stoops changing his mind, or a little bit of both. Just bad process. Don't don't let that stuff play out publicly before you come to the move. But getting Elko is a good result in that he is in line with what we've talked about Texas A&M needing to do. They didn't just go for the big name that was going to win you know, the press conference, like you, you heard as soon as this job came open, like, and even in the last few days, it's like Dabo's name was attached to it. Ryan Day's name was attached to it. They thought they were going to lure a sitting NFL coach of a division leading team in Dan Campbell back, you know, like just ridiculous kind of names that were thrown around for the job. And instead you got a good coach, somebody who is familiar with the place and somebody who can come and hopefully accomplish what it is you want to accomplish. And is somebody who like Mark Stoops, has done very well and won a lot of games at a place where it is difficult and there's not a long history of winning a lot of football games. But it's also, the context is strange in that the fan backlash and possible booster backlash to Mark Stoops, it's like, he, like Mike Elko is a different version of Mark Stoops. It's the same kind of thing. The only difference is from a pers like a, surface level perspective if you're an Aggie fan because even though they got to the right result there is still that thing I talked about whereas it's like we they, they have to be good enough for us like there's a certain kind of elitism in this program and that has been there for years that I think is a little too high for where they've been in that they look at Mark Stoops as he's the Kentucky coach but when they look at Mike Elko he's not the Duke coach He's our former defensive coordinator who we sent to Duke to learn how to become a head coach, and now we're bringing him back home. So it's just that kind of silly kind of perspective, I think, that makes it all weird. But again, it's a good hire. It's exactly the kind of coach they should have been going for. If uh, if I didn't like Mike Elko so much, I would root so hard for this to blow up in their face. Just Ooh. because I'm such not a fan of – the revolts, like to the reactions, because I think Mark Stoops would have been an excellent hire who's had a longer track record of success at a place that's really hard to win. But like I said, I like Mike Elko a lot. So like I get it. I think either one of these, I probably would have preferred Jeff Trailer as the number one option, but I get it. Like you want somebody a little bit more established. And I again, Mike Elko is one of my favorite guys to talk to. I think he's awesome. I think he can crush it. I'm very curious to see what direction he goes with offensively. You know, can and if there's a package deal, can he bring Riley Leonard with him? Um, but I, I I like the hire. I just I'm not a fan of and maybe this was more not a fan revolt than it was a board of regents revolt, like a you know, power players revolting, but I think it does speak to like the chaos that this could bring potentially and what it brought with Jimbo Fisher. You know, like why you had to pay a guy 77 million. Like you would think you would make, you would learn from some of those mistakes. And it just feels like there was no plan in place, which doesn't surprise me. And they're just kind of taking another swing at it, which hopefully it works again for Mike Elko, but it doesn't look like there were like a real clear cut plan in place. And at some point, I think some of that has to fall on the athletic director, you know, for the way this thing is un unfolded, you know, at some point these ADs and the people that are, 
writing these checks and signing these contracts should be held accountable, you would think. I mean, do you, do you think Bjork was the one who gave Jimbo the big extension? I I, I kind of doubt it, but I, I don't know. Like may, maybe he really whoever did. it was should be held accountable because it was completely yeah. unnecessary. Well, if, if 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 the guys who did it are, are the guys writing the checks, then I mean, like the the, the accountability is check the price of oil and figure out how, however much that cost them. Right. I, look, I, I do think that this was largely a cost saving move, but one that could work out for AM. I A&M. I don't think they wanted to pay what it was going to take to get Mark Stoops out, out of Kentucky. They're like, wait, we're going to pay that for Mark Stoops because that in this case is basically what you would have to already pay Jimbo. Like it, Mark Stoops was going to need like an $80 million deal to leave Kentucky because he's already set to make like 60 something at Kentucky. Right. Like, you're going to have to pay him a whole bunch. So you just made one of the most embarrassing mistakes by signing Jimbo to that huge deal off a of fake COVID year, right? Are you going to do the exact same thing to get Mark Stoops in there? Unless you're really, really confident that Mark Stoops is that guy who's going to bring you a national title. You can get discount Mark Stoops with, with, with Elko, right? Considerable discount for, compared to what you would have to pay Stoops and not have to pay a big buy out there. And, uh, and heck, I actually think Elko would do a good job. Like they, this is not a Pruitt situation to me. Like Pruitt right. was something when you first guessed. You're like, there's no way Pruitt's going to work out as a head coach. And and like people in the industry knew that and they thought it was it was an absolute disaster for a lot of reasons. And it was. Anum's process might suck. It might be like them going cheap, but I think Elko's a really nice guy to get there. 100%. Um, to your to your point, bud, about not wanting to pay the big bucks. The day after or the Monday after Jimbo was let go, and he was kind of explaining us the finances because I was under the impression that oil money is just going all over the place. They can do whatever they want. And remember the way that it was structured, the buyout was there was the 19 million up front. And then there was like 50 that was going to be spread out over, you know, seven, seven and a half million a year, I think for six years, whatever the number was that was spread out over. And he was like, that does impact their ability of, of who they can go get. And he's like, they'll still make a really good hire. He goes, but don't think they're going to go just drop $100 million at somebody's feet. And I think maybe that's what this was about, was maybe we really like Mark Stoops, but he what was he making at Kentucky? Nine a year? You know? Yeah. So, I mean, for them, yeah. I mean, you, you got to probably give them at least, you know, another 75, something like 80. That's what I'm saying. You know, like, so they're probably thinking, you know what, let's cut that in half for what we can get Elko in shorter term and a little bit better of a bargain. And again, I think it's a really good stock to buy, if you will, uh, since it's day trade and Danny Monday, I, I think it's at a really good price. I think you get really good value with Mike Elko. So what is the, what, what does the staff look like? What is the, what does the portal look like? What are the, what are the big challenges for Mike Elko as he begins his first year as the Aggies head coach? I, I think right now, I mean, obviously you've got to put together your staff, but I also think you need to figure out, you know, who are we trying to keep and who are we okay with if they want to leave? Like said, so that's part of the thing too. Like you, who, where was the article about Jimbo Fisher kind of just looking at 24 sevens recruit rankings and not really worrying about character concerns as much as just make sure they're five stars. Cause I definitely want to get, you know, the highest rated class. And we have seen like they've brought in a lot of talented players. Not all of them have worked out. So I think that getting in, getting the lay of the land with current coaches, there, deciding who you want to keep on your staff and just getting a good read on, Listen, this guy's a good player. We definitely want to do everything we can to keep him. If this guy wants to go, okay. I do think part of it is is, is about keeping keeping that recruiting class together that they bought, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you got a lot of guys that are pot committed to that class, and they're like, damn it, like we we need to keep these guys. We need to get something out of this. And Elko had a hand in, in at least establishing some of those recruiting relationships. And A and M has an extremely winnable schedule by A and M standards next year. So I. I do think like Jeff Brom, like El Elko will be expected to come in there and win nine or 10 games next year. Like if not, it's going to, it's going to be tough. Uh, what next? <laughs> I mean, right off the bat, like nine or 10 wins. I don't know, man. It's going to be, I really mean, like that, to that's that. gotta be the next, like, no, I, I get what you're saying, but it's like, the, they the, play? Yeah, yeah, I know, but man. Nope. No Bama, no Georgia. All right, hold on. Sumlin never had a bottom fallout year, right? He was no, just I think he was like maybe seven. Five. I think it was coming, but no, he did not have it. Yeah, and the worst it ever got for Jimbo was the five and seven year. I mean, it is kind of a 
anybody can show up and go win six, seven games. And that's where you're hoping that Mike Elko with what he's been able to prove both as a, as a coordinator, defensive mind, but also as a head coach, you know, being able to get his team prepared for game day, I mean, winning games with third string future hedge fund managers at quarterback, much respect to Grayson Loftus. You got a long career ahead of you. We'll see what you got, got big body, but not, not really sure if I see it quite yet. Um, he still got that group to seven wins this year. I mean, that was a, it was a remarkable coaching job. So you are hoping then that if six to seven wins is, is probably your floor, that Elko's excellence at the margins is what's going to get you up there to nine, 10 wins. I don't think that's an un, unreasonable expectation or goal to be having for instant results for Elko in College Station. They're favored in 11 games next year, right? I, I don't no, have I don't have their schedule in front of me. All right, so Notre Dame at home. I think so. New Mexico State, obviously. Arkansas neutral. Watch out. At Auburn, at Florida, at Mississippi State, at South Carolina. Host LSU, host Missouri, host Texas. Like, Texas is probably the one where they're a dog, I think. Okay, so they're favored in some of those games, but still at Auburn, at Florida. Like, these are – Notre Dame, these are not exactly games where it's like, I just expect Texas A&M, based off everything I have seen from this program, to be like, oh, yeah, 9-3, 10-2. Like, I, I think A&M fans are doing themselves a disservice if they go into next year thinking we need to win 9 or 10 games. But if you bought just, that recruiting class, you damn sure think, like, we have more talent than, than all those teams. Like, we better win. There's no LSU either on that no, schedule? No, they, they get LSU, LSU at home. Nation. But it's no Bama, no Georgia. That's the no key. Bama, no Bama, no Georgia, LSU at home. And you get South Carolina, you get Mississippi State. The only way it could be easier is, is, is if they get the Vandy, which they don't. But, like, you know. It, Do they get both Texas and Oklahoma? No Oklahoma. Uh, no Oklahoma either. I mean, it's it's Arkansas, Auburn, Florida, Mississippi State, South Carolina, LSU, Missouri, Texas. This but is don't, probably the easiest SEC schedule they're going to have in, like, a 10-year period. Don't sleep on the SEC West killers. New Mexico State Aggies. And it's I, it's the same weekend for probably the same buyout, you know, the same payout that they got from Auburn, too. Uh, listen, I'll tell you what. Mike Elko won't be sleeping on it. He'll know. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's not going to let that. That man's attention to detail is too sharp. Speaking of, that rough, rough, rough spot for the Blue Devils. So what, what does Duke do from here? Do you go young up-and-comer, or do you go somebody a little bit longer in the tooth? Who might be wanting to to settle down? Because, you know, I think that what I've I've noticed we we recorded the Instant Reaction podcast. I had not at the time that we did the emergency pod gotten a chance to really dig into the some of the Duke fan reaction to this. But there's a lot of hurt, you know, a, a lot of disappointment, and whether or not you want to be a program that is going to be in this position where you are a launching pad to bigger programs, or whether you want to try to make a hire with someone that you think is going to be able to you know, establish a long runway. And I have seen strong arguments for both approaches. So where does Duke go from here? Mm. I, I don't know where they go, but like, <clears throat> I don't think you make a hire just based on, Hey, this guy will be here a long time because this is the reality of the situation. I'm not saying it doesn't suck, but if a coach comes to Duke and is winning 10 games a year and then competing, you know, like how who knows how many games they win if Riley Leonard stays healthy this year. But any coach that comes to Duke and wins like Mike Elko has been winning is going to be attractive to bigger jobs because you're Duke. Like, nothing personal. You're never going to be a top-tier job in this sport. So the big dogs are going to come around and they're going to poach your guy if he wins. So if I'm a Duke fan, yeah, it would be great if we can get somebody to come win games and stay. But I don't think that's a realistic expectation. I think the only thing I'm thinking is I want to get the right coach and then we'll figure it out from there. You know, Bud, you brought up a name on here a while ago, a couple weeks ago, about Bob Chesney, the coach at Holy Cross. Like, I think that would be a, like a really solid hire. And Mike Elko, don't forget, he was a, you know, Ivy League guy. Mm -hmm. You have to get somebody who understands the type of player and use that to your advantage. Like, use smart players to your advantage, scheme wise, you know, get that chip on the shoulder. And, you know, looking at what the job he did at Holy Cross, I think something like that. But I also think coming in with the realization that you probably, like, if you go, he's 47, I was just looking at his age. Like, if he's there four years, three years, crushes it, and then goes on, like, 
good. You got three great years. You know, you kept the program healthy, you know, and hopefully a winner through that. It is tough, man. I mean, especially with the future of the ACC kind of up in the air, where does Duke go? Like, you're probably just going to either be a stepping stone job to the next bigger opportunity, exactly like Elko is, or do you go get somebody kind of older who's had a lot of success, who may be just content to be there seven or eight years and then kind of hand the reins to the next guy? That's an eternity. Like Cutcliffe. Cutcliffe like seven, eight years is an eternity in a college yeah. football lifespan if mm -hmm. you are good. So in the emergency pod, I mentioned a bun. I said, Willie Fritz. Yes. He'll yeah. be a pain in the ass for every other team in the ACC. You can sort of establish your system. You are uh, going to be, you know, uh, able to sit there and, and set things up. But the other side of this, uh, an up and comer with some private school experience would be Tommy Reese. So when I'm thinking about the fork in the road, you know, do you go with a, a Tommy Reese hire where, and again, like I've, this is no reporting. These are all just profiles that were sort of uh, tap it. Would you rather be on the experienced? We think he's going to stay a little bit or a lot of promise. And if it pops, you just know you're going to lose him. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a big decision that uh, Duke has to make here in very, very quickly because Mike Elko is leaving right at the time that there are multiple players on that roster, Riley Leonard among them, who are going to be, you know, receiving some interest to go make a lot of money in the transfer portal. Um, you got to put together a staff. You got to try to hold together whatever kind of recruiting class, you know, there is there for Duke. And um, and it's a, it's a busy time of year for that. So big decisions to be made at Duke and not a lot of time to make them. I will reiterate. If my choices are Willie Fritz or Tommy Reese, no offense to Tommy Reese, but I want Willie Fritz, not because I think he'll be there for a long time, but because I know he's a very good coach who's already done it. What about Sean Lewis? Yeah. Yeah. Sean Unique Lewis offense, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I, I do think you need something along those lines, too. Yeah. If you're Duke, I mean, and the dust is settling around this, and Fritz didn't get the Mississippi State job, which I, I think – I'd much rather have Willie Fritz than Jeff Levy. Uh, if he didn't get that job and you're like, you're sitting there like, whoa, that's still available. I would go get Willie Fritz. Yeah. But the guy's if you're Willie Fritz, he's doing. if you're Willie Fritz, would you rather have the Duke job or the Houston job? What job comes with more realistic expectations? Cause I don't think Houston's close to being competitive in the big 12. I, I think like they need to make like a real far from being competitive in the big 12. We've talked about this all year. Once Houston, or once Oklahoma and Texas are gone, the big 12 is just a random number generator. I, I generally agree for most of those teams. I, I don't know how well Dana's recruited, but I think you get a couple years to get it up to speed. Like I think you get a free year pass and then I, I would trust fits to, build but to your question tom i would i think there's higher upside and if you know if you want to compete for championships which I, most coaches i think would right that you would go to houston mm -hmm. but i no, think you better job. no foia you know like no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> nobody knows how much money you're actually making i mean come on this is a this is a great durham is a lovely place to live Coach restaurant scene on. is no great. foia <laughs> don't forget it don't forget. I mean, that was somebody mentioned. Uh, I think I think USA Today's Dan Walken. Um, it, by the way, since then, the idea that John Gruden was tied to the Indiana search has been, you know, squashed. Says who? I say it's it's oh, got no, legs. Keep that going. John right. Gruden is seriously in contention for the Indiana job. So Walken, favorite uh, fact. Dan, Dan came out and he was like, "So you're telling me we might have John Gruden at a place where we can FOIA his emails in an election year?" Oh, baby, let's go. <laughs> Got to get a laugh out of that. All right, well, we just mentioned it. Let's uh, hit a quick break and then come back. Coming up on the other side, what to make of the Jeff Levy hire at Mississippi State. Some of the jobs that are still open, ones that might be coming open with more firing, more coaching carousel. Next. Time is ticking in the group stage with first place finishes up for grabs and spots in the knockout stage on the line. Every second is crucial. The UEFA Champions League on CBS Sports Network and streaming live on Paramount+. Plus. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast and uh, another announcement from Sunday made official. Oklahoma offensive coordinator Jeff Lebby will be the next head coach at Mississippi State. Uh, Danny, we, we are going right back, right? We had Mike Leach. 
promoted the defensive coordinator. No, 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 no. Let's let, let's go back. Offensive leaning once again. Uh, what are your what are your expectations, or what do you think the big selling points are for Levy as he takes over that program in Starkville? Oh, you mentioned. I mean, you nailed it right there. That's the selling point. Is we've got one of the best offensive minds in the country. Look at how many points um, Oklahoma put up this past season. Look at potentially could be a package deal with Dylan Gabriel. Remember, uh, Dylan Gabriel followed him from UCF out there to Oklahoma. He's still got another year left. You could possibly see that. You know, this is this is the the top of the list of who are the uh, you know coordinator hires. This is a guy that comes up. He feels like he's next in line. He was close last year, and you know somebody who's really been kind of aiming to get that opportunity. I just when you look at this job, the expectations were, and I think all of these like you have to adjust your expectations based on the job. I just wonder if like what Dan Mullen did there, how replicable, uh, how hard is that to replicate? <laughs> yes, I guess yes. Re- 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 Isn't it replicable? Uh, well, um, he's, you know, he set a bar really high. It's kind of like what James Franklin did at Vanderbilt. And those runs are probably really rare as opposed to what the norm should be. You know, so like if you can get eight wins and you're happy, yeah, I think he could do that. I mean, he's a good recruiter. He's young. He's going to bring some energy to it. And I think it's also, you know, you went totally different direction after Leach. You went defense, you know in-house kept it i get why you did and so now you're going right back to like the ex-girlfriend you know model bud you sound like you hate it by the way no i i i don't hate it i just like when when you let mississippi state or, or missouri and texas and m and oklahoma and texas in the conference you you've, you've turned your job into a take the take the check take the losses job uh, i I'm over on Gene's page, and I, I I think our Mississippi State 24-7 sports site does a great job. Like, they are the stone-cold nuts of coverage, right? But, I mean, like, you see, like, like people saying, like, oh, if, if we hire this guy or that guy, you know, we're, we're, we're doomed to go, like, 7-5 and five or 8-4. and four. I'm like, doomed? That'd be great. <laughs> Y'all better be celebrating 7-5. and five. <laughs> Like, I, it's about to be harder to get three SEC wins and four cupcake wins in the non-conference. I don't know. I just I think a lot of these I mean to me there's nine jobs in the SEC that really try that are competing to win and there's seven jobs that aren't. And I think I'm curious about what the attitude of fans at the at the, at the bottom seven are going to be in in the longer term. It's kind of, it's similar to the Arkansas discussion we had. But like look, can Levy like assemble a staff and run a program? I have no idea. I'm sure he'll score points. Right. Which, and I and I think he does something that is kind of unique. Although, look, Tennessee is running it. Old Miss runs something kind of similar. Like it's not as unique within uh, the SEC as it once was. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, it makes a lot of sense in that we talked about it. Offenses when they've had their success, whether it was Dan Muller or Mike Leach, those are the guys who brought it. So, bringing in an offensive system and scoring points, it works. It makes sense to go back to the well. Fair or not, I've spent way too much time having to write and read about what happened at Baylor Mm. to where I would ever be comfortable hiring anybody from that staff. And then considering what happened at Oklahoma this year with Art Browse on the sideline. And then I I, like I I don't judge Levy for it because it is his father in law. Like what what the hell is he supposed to do? Not defend the guy. But it's just it is a tricky situation to me. And it is kind of a sketchy situation, but putting all that aside, it makes sense. But it's also funny to me because we were talking about the Texas a and hire and Ralph Russo had a great tweet about this from the AP, who's the person you want to blame for every AP vote you don't like, whether it's the football or the college basketball poll. He said that it's hilarious that Mark Stoops has all the success he had at Kentucky and <laughs> He, he gets a revolt when he's announced as the new coach of Texas A&M. Meanwhile, Oklahoma fans have spent the half the season bitching and moaning about Jeff Levy and wanting to get rid of him. And Mississippi State fans are carrying their AD on their shoulders. They're so excited with the hire. So it's just it's a funny kind of just comparison of the two situations. But yeah, no, we'll see. It's it's a really tough job. And you're right, bud. Mississippi State fans sitting and thinking we're only going to go seven and five with this guy might be in for a rude awakening. I think there's the, the chat said Mullen is the only guy to get hired 
up and out of Mississippi State since Dara Royal. Whoa. Wow. Late, late 50s or early 60s, mm -hmm. right? That's a really tough job. Like, that is a great fan base. Like, we talk about South Carolina yes. being a great fan base. Like, man, they show up. I, I thought the scene at the airport was awesome last night. It then like, the fans didn't vote to expand the SEC twice. The, the administrators mm -hmm. did, you know, and, and, and the presidents, because they're going to make more money off it. But again, I don't sit around at the tailgate and be like, man, I'm glad that assistant AD makes 190 now instead instead of 110. That's not fun you know, for me as a fan. You know what you need to do at Mississippi State, like probably more important than the hiring process. And I, you know, the, I'd say this about Duke too, scheduling. Because I I mean, remember Mullen, they had I would take the cupcake weekend and say, no, 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 we'll play whoever. Let, let us play Alabama cupcake weekend. And let's take the, all those cupcakes. Let's put all four of those early games and let's put them try to go four and oh. Get some momentum, get some positive vibes, and then you know you go two and two, and you're kind of still in the race. Like scheduling, I mean, Mississippi State just feels like one of those programs that historically, well, it's like Maryland does, and Maryland does that. And you're like, yeah, and you start to buy in, you get some excitement, and then you get to the wall, and it's like, oh boy, you just hope you can go 500 from there on out. Mm -hmm. But you man, know who else you does can, that? What's Texas that? A&M. <laughs> that's that's been Texas A&M's mode for years too. <laughs> Right. But especially at these programs, you know, like you got to you got to try to create some of that mojo early in the season against some winnable games and carry it through. It's going to be hard. I mean, they Greg Sankey's not that worried about you guys. You know, he's got a whole conference to take care of. I I was incredibly disrespectful on the emergency pod yesterday. I was just going off the top of my head. And I was running through all these open jobs, just trying to do a little status check. And I ignored our friends in Bloomington. Just completely forgot about it. One of the biggest, one of the biggest announcements of Sunday. Tom Allen out. And look, I I heard, I heard from Indiana fans. The internet was working in Indiana. And they were not distracted by their blue blood basketball program. No, no, no. They were ready to say, hey, what about us? So I bring that. Where Tom, where does Indiana go from here? First of all, I'm not surprised that you ACC homers would completely forget that there is a <laughs> firing in the Big Ten. And yes, I'd, I'm happy that you're finally coming to realize that there are Big Ten fans and they do get kind of angry online. Um, I was surprised. Like, I thought that this could be coming based on just the fact that Indiana had not been good at all the last few years. And like kind right. of all the mojo from that 2020 season had long dissipated. But there was the $20 million buyout that was looming over everything. And just historically, Indiana has never been the program that was like, we will swallow a pill that size to make sure that the football program can kind of rebound and at least get back in the right direction. Again, the so, bleachers are falling apart, all mm -hmm. right? Like, I, I've, I've not seen investment. But, I mean, I think this is clearly a sign that now that the Big Ten is going to 18 and you've got a billion dollars a year coming in, because, like, this is – this is an interesting situation. I'll get to Indiana specifically in a second, but I want to start bigger picture here in that we have seen conference realignment and what it is doing. The Pac-12 is gone. As of right now, the little guys that were just in these conferences already in the SEC, the Big Ten, Big 12, are getting to stay. At some point, we are going to reach, and we are seeing this in the ACC right now, the point where you have to pull your weight financially or they're going to kick your ass out for somebody else. And I'm wondering if Indiana is kind of smart enough to realize that and looking at the future saying, we need to start putting more money in this football program or they're going to kick us out for somebody else, whether it's Kansas or another Big 12 school or another whatever in the future. So I think this is a sign of that potentially for Indiana in that it is starting to take football seriously and not to the point where it's like, we're going to win the big 10 and get to the playoff, but at least where we are going to try to be a bowl program year in and year out. And we're not going to accept bad results. So they negotiated the buyout down to, I think 15 million instead of 20. So now it's only the third largest buyout in the history of the sport. So congratulations, Indiana, <laughs> but it's, it'll be interesting to see where they go. There are, you know, John, like I said, John Gruden is clearly the favorite for the job. It's his if he wants it. The offer is out there. He is mulling it over. But, like, it's going to be interesting to see how this job looks, where it fits with the open jobs. Because it's a Big Ten job, so it's going to have plenty of money. But will it? it's not the most desirable of the jobs that are available. It is going to be very tough. 
it's easier now that you don't have to play Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State every year, but you're still going to be getting your head caved in by a tough schedule every single year, no matter what in this league going forward. So what do they do? It's kind of like a Duke situation. Do they want to go for the young up and up and comer? Do they want to find somebody more established to kind of just build a foundation and get going in the right direction? I don't know. I, I know Indiana fans would love it if Ryan Grubb, the offensive coordinator at Washington, who works under Caleb DeBoer and was at Indiana with Caleb DeBoer when he was the offensive coordinator there because that's when they were last having fun in Indiana football. They have their heart set on him. I think that would make sense. You mentioned Tommy Reese for the Duke job. I've heard Tommy Reese's name mentioned for Indiana. I don't know if that's where the school is looking to go, but it could make sense. He's familiar with the he grew up, you know, in, in suburban Chicago. He played at Notre Dame. He's familiar with all the area. But it's – I have no idea where they're going to go, but it's going to be an interesting situation to follow. And I'm actually optimistic if I'm an Indiana fan that it's happening. I, uh, 20- I Go ahead, Dan. No, I was going to say 2019, I think, was the year I went and covered an Indiana game. Covered 2020, too, but it was COVID, so we didn't do it in person. But Kalen DeBoer met with him and Kane Womack met with him as well if you wanted to go with somebody with ties to indiana now he's at south alabama he did have a good year two years ago they were six and six this year but those ties i think what what style works like is this one of those places where i mean if there was ever a perfect option to do the option triple option somewhere like that like this is the perfect kind of fit because you're not going to be able to stack up to you know go toe to toe with the four and five star recruits you're gonna have to face with the bigger schools in the big ten Kansas is running the triple option right now. They just call it something different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We've had 30 full seasons, so not the COVID year, since the sport went to 85 scholarships. Like, that's a pretty clear line of demarcation for me, right? It, 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 because it, cu- it cuts you down. You couldn't hoard quite as much talent. The talent should be spread around more. Indiana has made four bowl games in the last 30 years. Mm-hmm. Four. Like this idea that they're going to be going to bowl games every year is is not realistic because the Big Ten is get. I know they're getting out of the East, but the Big Ten is getting harder because all four teams that you brought in are much better than you are. Like even when they're down, they're still way better than than whatever your best is. But like I read Zach Osterman a lot of the Indianapolis Star. I think he had a really good hot board and he had a, a pretty good column today explaining like, all right, here's some of the investment they've made. Here's some of the investment that they they are still planning to make, need to make, and yeah, I, I was like, okay, why are they doing this? And it does seem like the AD there cares about uh, cares about being good at football. I think Tom's point is really good on this. Uh, the problem with the triple option is that the fans don't like watching it, right? Now, could you get to bowls more often if you ran? I do think that what we set up Mississippi State has to apply here. You need to run something that people are going to be, like think it's a pain in the ass to prep for you. You need to probably be able to upset like, not in Ohio State or Michigan, but like a decent team in the league that doesn't take you seriously. Hmm. Oh, sorry, guys. I don't know what that the burner? So oh. is that a big buy? Was that yeah. somebody just placed There's a big on the SEC championship yeah, I, game? I, I, I found I found a way to pair my phone with my computer now, and now now it rings. Okay, great. So even though I got my few, my phone muted, circle limits just went up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know what? That you know what? Limit increase. Fine. You know what this job needs? Until we get things straightened out. Hey, Coach, I would do this too. You guys could all be on my staff because I think you could all make things work financially. What's the going rate for an Indiana head coach? Six million a year? Five million a year? I would say five at this point, yeah. All right. I'll do it for two. And I'll take three million and I'll put that towards the roster. And and I'll, I'll buy a roster that can be somewhat competitive and... My staff will have to take a little bit of a discount too. There's another million, you know, spread out for whatever your staff allotment is. Let's go buy, let's go buy a roster and make it work. Like to me, this is the type of program that you would have to do that. Cause I, cause I mean, look, I, I've said it the other day on, uh, on Thursday, whatever day we did the pod about, you know, Indiana's quarterback was using that game as a free agent. He's already entered the portal. Like, how do you keep a guy like Soresby who's shown some flash? You can. Good this year. Yeah. You know? Totally. Like, what? What if you went and got like like Tim Alban at Ohio or Chuck Martin at Miami, Ohio, guys who are like proven they know what the heck they're doing, like they're exceedingly competent in the Midwest. Tim Alban makes seven hundred k, right? Jeez, you could triple that guy, pay him, pay him two, you know, and be like, hey, 
we're 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 gonna get we're gonna get some players. Like you you'd be better than Rutgers pretty quickly, I think, if, if you did that. Right? Like, would you rather have have players and a two million dollar Tim Alvin, or would you rather have like a seven million dollar Greg Schiano and Rutgers players? I know what I would take. I get it. I do wonder why it hasn't worked as clean. Like, why why can't you do that? Well, maybe why can't you do that is the same reason why Quinnen Williams said he picked Alabama over Auburn. It's because he went to the facilities and he mm-hmm. saw who was there and he saw who was on the walls and he knows that he wants to go to the NFL and the kind of players who are going to be good enough to transform your results probably are also trying to get to the NFL and probably also you know, looking around at the Indiana facility and not seeing the same thing. So you'd be not to go all Connor stallions on this, but like you'd be getting a very unique uh, prospect that is just coming for money and has so much self-confidence and belief that the NFL is going to find them wherever that they want to transform that with not the iron sharpens iron highest caliber of teammate, but that they want to be on the forefront. Like it's a, but you know what you do? What? By the way, I think we all know a GM uh, uh, that could maybe you know be willing to leave his current job, come help us out, evaluate the talent. When I say spend money, I don't think you're talking about four and five stars. Like I just think you have mm-hmm. to come up with that expectation of we're yeah. not going to be spending with Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State, but we can spend those three right, star guys that are on and the, exactly yeah. and Minnesota, keep, Iowa, yeah, and mm-hmm. keep our in house talent, Nebraska. Like you can keep your in house talent, go get some guys, win some of those battles. And get a much more competitive roster than you know spending all that money on a head coach. I am going to tweet right now that the sources close to me are indicating that the two top names for the Indiana job are John Gruden and Danny Cannell. <laughs> so go. anybody watching right now will understand what this is. If you Can't don't confirm, oh, everyone, else, <laughs> everyone else would think this is nuts. We're, we're going to have revenue sharing. Sooner That's rather the than thing. Later. Yeah, like it's coming. Like the smart team. In the NFL, what, what's the breakdown of player salary pool versus coach salary pool? 51. Uh, it's like 50, 51. It's like right at 50. Wait, really? what? No, there's no way that, that coaches make the same as players do. Oh, oh, I thought you were talking about the revenue split between no, players and ownership. owners. Mm-hmm. NFL, it's got to yeah, be like 90 10, right? Or 95 yeah, yeah, yeah. 5? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Close to that. Maybe 80 20. Because NFL well, salaries for yeah, coaches have been They're rising. up to like 200 something yeah. million for the, each team. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we'll we're going to get to a spot where players combined as a roster make more than coaches do, and 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 this conversation we're having here will will seem you know pretty pretty tame in comparison to where we're going to get. But right now right. it seems kind of extreme, and, and there's still kind of a stigma of paying players as opposed to paying coaches or, or putting your money into facilities. But you got to fire coaches all the time. Like coaches bust just as often as players do. You know, you know who would make sense for Indiana in all seriousness. Sean Lewis would make a lot of sense for Indiana. Yeah. It's an it's an identity. He played at Wisconsin. He knows the Big Ten. He coached in the MAC, so he's familiar with the territory. He knows the kind of players. Like, the difference to start with, like, you you want to get better. But as far as recruiting goes, a lot of the guys you're getting in the MAC are the same kind of guys Indiana needs to be finding at this point because you're not going to be, you know, taking things from Notre Dame, Michigan, Ohio State. So, yeah, that would make sense. Um, we mentioned the Houston job open. Uh, they parted ways with Dana Holgerson. Uh, the Syracuse job is still open. Uh, Dan Mullen actually on Twitter squashing any no reply guy Dan Mullen. Reply He's guy awesome. Dan Mullen <laughs> dropping news in the Minchies. He's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, what what are we expecting? What do you keep? Uh, Chip Kelly still has a job, and you know maybe that has to do with. The fact that his buyout's going to drop in mid-December, maybe they're trying to save a little bit of money um, on that front. What's what, what's the expectation for the next big domino on the coaching carousel? I, I don't know. Nick Saban retires. Kirk Ferentz retires. No, 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 no. <laughs> let's, let's talk about we, Kirk we, Ferentz we, crying Mac again, by the way. Mm-hmm. Who was that? Mac, Mac Brown? Brown? Yeah. We'll oh, see. Duke and North Carolina open at the same time. Uh oh, buddy. No, nah, you at rivalry. Least, if we didn't have the good reporting from Billy Lucci and others to describe to us what happened, I was going to blame it on a failure in communication. You know how, like, a lot of these people sort of speak in code words with each other, or maybe in text messages mm-hmm. that, like, they said, okay, they got him. It's from a blue blood basketball school, defensive leaning. And somebody said, Mark Stoops. And then we said, oh, no, no, no. We meant Elko. But <laughs> yeah. 
if we had uh, Carolina Duke, India, Indiana, and Syracuse all open at the same time, <laughs> hoop season, baby. Let's go. <laughs> Basketball right. season. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're uh, we're, we're going to obviously be on top of this basically for the next month or so. So uh, we appreciate it. It was a big weekend, and we'll continue to track all the latest on the coaching carousel. Coming up on the other side, back to the trading room floor. What's the market saying? What's the analysis? Day Train Danny coming up next. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast. And as we're starting to plan out really what things are going to look like, you know, once the now that the regular season is done, we're going to, of course, have you um, locked and loaded with tons of bold thoughts, breakdowns, and uh, looking ahead to the playoff. But that, that big old bag of mail is gathering some dust. So a reminder, as we start to make the mailbag a more regular segment here on the Cover 3 podcast in the coming months, you go leave us a five-star review. You put that question in your review. We will tackle it in a future mailbag episode. Um, this, this is a great time for, uh, for a lot of those different sort of conversations that are bigger picture. How could you imagine this? What if this happens? A lot of hypotheticals always in the mailbag. So feel free to go ahead and fill it up. Every single Monday, we like to check in with our market analyst, Day Trading Danny. All right, market's open. Let's go. Let's get right to it because uh, we're coming down the stretch here, uh, f- the f- uh, final quarter of the uh, 2023 year. We got to make sure we make some strong moves. I have uh, a couple holds here I wanted to address because I am only holding two in the Heisman race. Bo Nix, who I bought after they lost to Washington, one of the best buys of the year, and uh, Jaden Daniels, uh, LSU quarterback. Those are the only two guys I am holding for the Heisman. I sold Penix, sold Carson Beck. Boy, Bud was a spot on on that. I said he was 50-1 to 1 last week. Should you take a nibble? And you said, no, he's going the wrong direction. Sure enough, he's at 100-1 to 1 now. Uh, the game against Georgia Tech wasn't great. Um, Jalen Milrow selling. I don't know if that was ever a serious buy anyway, but if you say, give me the Heisman after completing a Hail Mary, bro, give me about 20 more touchdown passes, then get back to me. That ain't going to happen in the SEC championship game. So pipe down a little bit. It was amazing, the Milrow (laughs) miracle, but I am selling the Heisman stock of those three guys. Should I be hanging on to anybody else besides Bo Nix or Jaden Daniels? Specifically, should I be keeping... Michael Penix. I feel like selling him is the right thing to do. I would sell. He hadn't looked right for about a month. Yeah. 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 But I, I mean, know I, he I, could I, knock out. He could eliminate Bo Nix by having a four touchdown game and Nick yeah. struggles and he wins that game. But then I do feel like that's where Daniels comes back to the conversation. Like I think that's Daniels path. I mean, but it, I mean, shoot, if he does a two throw, two minute drill to lead from behind and score the winning touchdown, like that could be Penix's in if he gets there. I just, I'm not, I don't know if I see it. And he has been banged up. So, um, and I ballot's, think Monix, what's the, that? Ballots got delivered this morning. Only three spots on that ballot. It does feel like there are three names. And if you think, that Penix, even as banged up as he is, can go have a heroic performance standalone spot on Friday night leading into championship Saturday, you know, have, like you said, four touchdowns and maybe he is hurt and maybe we even can tell that he's hurt, but he's just Jake Hayner in it out there, you know, just leaving it on the field. I mean, there's a lot of romantic uh, voters that would look at that and use that as a reason to name him the most outstanding player in college football. For sure. All right, you know what I'm buying? You guys might think I'm crazy. I'm I buying Auburn's defense at the end of the game against, yes, I'm calling it a Hail Mary. I mean, I know uh, we ran it every practice. Everybody runs a Hail Mary drill at the end of every practice. I am totally okay with rushing two, and they even had a spy, so they did kind of have three there for him. You have everybody backed up in the end zone, and because one guy loses his – spatial awareness and takes his eye off the ball, which is basically what you should have been doing. I'm selling the defender. I am not, I'm buying the defense, the scheme itself, 
because all you had to do, it's sort of like basketball when you're playing sort of help defense and you're kind of keeping one eye on the defender, the other's on the ball, and you're kind of keeping an eye on both. So when the ball's in the air for like three or four seconds because it's a 40-yard pass because he had to drop back, that you can react to it. Why? The defensive back took his eyes off the ball and was looking around and had no clue where the ball was. That is not a reason for me to sell the scheme. So I'm selling the player. I'm buying the scheme. Why are we spying with 30? Yeah, that's what I was about to say. We don't need a spy on fourth and goal from the 31. I, I and I, in <laughs> fact, I wish that now that's another good one. Like the spy thing didn't make a lot of sense. I think you would have preferred to have him rush from the pocket, start running because once he crosses the line of scrimmage, rally to the ball. Yes. Right. Then mm -hmm. you just come up and make yeah. a tackle, keep him in front of you. I mean, so the spy, I would question, but the, I would have rushed him then instead. I would have said rush three instead of having the spy. But in the secondary, I thought was the bigger collapse there for Auburn uh, at the end of the game. Uh, others. You know who I am? Uh, I'm buying groomers. We talked about that. <laughs> Not groomers. Groomer. I want to make sure I don't say that right. Okay, I'll say, wait, <laughs> I'm buying the John Gruden groomer. We're going to need that groomers. sound clip, Jordan. I'm buying I am groomers. buying groomers left and right. <laughs> going not. the best groomers on the beach. Definitely not <laughs> buying the groomers out there. Buying the John Gruden rumors that are out there. I know Tom had my back on that one. Uh, let's get him not only the Indiana job, let's mention him for every job. Let's get him back in the conversation. <laughs> it makes it that more interesting for college football as a whole. Um, head coaches, I am. So I'm I'm buying. I, want, I, have a, I have a pitch for you guys. And this is sometimes like if I'm your market analyst, this is the pitch I have to make to you guys. Because I feel like at some point there would be a bubble for the head coaches buyout money that's out there. But I don't know if there is. I mean, it keeps going up. We mentioned Tom Allen getting $15 million. Dana Holgerson at Houston getting $15 million. We saw No Jimbo at $77 million. Where can we go provide some insurance that we can buy stock in the buyout that it's going to happen and it's going to be big and it gives the school some protection, but then you get some return on your investment? Is anybody smart enough to come up with a plan for that? Almost like an insurance policy you can buy in on and then if, if the coach coaches and he rides off the sunset or retires or goes somewhere else, then you're stuck with zero. But if he's fired, you get a portion of the buyout. So we're bundling bad mortgages and selling them to other banks. Yes, pretty much. Worked out. Jordan, Jordan, there's another. So speaking of, I know where that comes from, what movie that comes from. There's another aspect to this. Give me my clip. This is the first synthetic CDO. I love Selena Gomez. I bet you 50 million she wins. And I'll give you a... Three to one odds. Three to one odds? Okay, I'll take that bet. Now, somebody else is gonna wanna make a bet on the outcome of their Actually, bet. 50 million she wins. That will lead to synthetic CDO number two. Hey, I bet you 200 million that lady in the glasses wins that bet. <laughs> she probably will win. So I want a great payoff. How about 20 to one? Deal. And this will go on and on. All right, so that goes on and on. So there's some sort of an idea what you potentially could do with coaches, but you know what it could do in reality? If you remember it, there was a hand of blackjack that was dealt when she started that scene. You guys are holding some really good tickets that I want a piece of. And I think we could maybe... So who is holding Oklahoma State to win the Big 12? <laughs> Both tough. of you guys? Do yeah. you guys want to make any deal on that? Like, what, <laughs> And what odds are you at? And what ones could I possibly get in on? Um... I have already hedged to the gills. <laughs> <laughs> as you should be. As you should be. Yeah, as a 14-point underdog, I felt that the f the safer fiscal choice on my part was to hedge. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm not I'm not overextended on it. Like I I, I may or may not hedge. I, I'm, I'm, I might do like a YouTube short on like what's the proper hedge strategy, but really it is largely a function of like what's your bankroll and how much did you actually put on this? Right. I mean, if you put like two or three percent of your bank on it, you probably should hedge. Right. If, if you put like, you know, half of a percent or a quarter of a percent, then, you know, probably not. Right. Like if, if your bank's like 100K and you put like 500 bucks on it, probably just ride it. You know, <laughs> I'm just just using for round numbers. Right. It's easier right. than saying like if your bank's a thousand bucks, you put 50 cent, you know. Yeah. So, Chip, do you want some action? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'll three to one. Swimming <laughs> in. Make a bet that their ticket hits and they'll, they'll go <laughs> at their odds. Swimming in deep waters. Boy needs floaties. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that's how you had a market collapse. Yeah, Explain yeah. in a nutshell. But right aren't there. you also on some Louisville too? I do. I do have some Louisville. Yeah. Yeah. That. Uh, probably let that ride too. Oh I'm boy, a couple more LLB. cells to close out the uh, the action uh, here on a uh, day trade and Danny Monday. I'm selling ESPN's FPI. I it used to piss me off so much. I, do you guys see the latest one? No. Where it had like the playoff odds. To, oh yeah. Did you you know which one I'm talking about, right? Yeah, but like, is it a bit or is it real? Because like like if you're Allstate. Who's, who sponsors it, you're loving this because like it gets so many interactions on Twitter and social media. Like, it, I it's... wish it was a bit, but these are the formulas. So Ohio State, number one, right? Now, after what we saw this weekend, Michigan two, Oregon three, Penn State, everybody loves Nittany Lions, and I get all those Penn State backers love that four ranking in the FBI. Georgia at five, Bama six, uh, Oklahoma at eight, behind Texas at seven, Florida State checking in at nine with LSU right behind them. I'm just, I'm at a point where should we retire the FPI? I, I think we should just retire it. Well, all right. think it so serves it's, a not a, it's a power rate. It's a power yeah, rate. Yeah, correct. But isn't Everyone's it flawed? Power, but isn't everyone's it power broken? rating is different. Like, you know, if you assemble, if you look at lots of different power ratings, their Florida State's power rating for a while now has not lined up with its poll position or its ranking position according to the selection committee. Now, yeah. this is like when Nick Saban went on all of those shows and was like, well, Las Vegas says that we'd be favored against all the playoff teams. And we were like, yeah, well, Nick, it's not. There's some most deserving, too. Florida State's pass to the college football playoff is not for best. It is one of the most deserving. That they have earned it on the field. And a power rating is not going to say that Florida State is a top four team. But I'm glad that we don't use a power rating. Because if we only used a power rating to pick playoff teams, why play the games? Also, exactly. I will say, like... <clears throat> What Chip's saying is true. If you've been betting Florida State games using power ratings this year, you're losing your ass. Like, for whatever reason, the numbers are not catching up to how well they've played. I don't know. I don't know exactly what it is. Coaching, quarterback, something like that, maybe. It, but, like, yeah, you, you're – you would have been fading them in almost every game, and they, they've been covering quite often. I was for the first half of the year, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I said uh, I'm done. I'm out of this. I'm you played him it. on our pregame show against Florida, so uh -huh. I want to remind you of that one. How'd that yeah. one work out? Oh man, I was proving a moron there for sure. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? I'm going to say that is coaching. Two reasons. Number one, on the surface level, Florida State's been a good second half team, an excellent fourth quarter team, with the exception of the Boston College game early in the season. Yeah. They have been doing a good job of outscoring their opponents after halftime. So that is a coaching decision to run it up when you can and also to make adjustments when things aren't going well. So I, off the top of my head, I would credit Norvell for that one. Uh, I know I already sold Colorado after Dion threw his players under the bus once. And I think at the time I said, I still think in year two, you could see that big turnaround. I'm selling the year two turnaround. And I think a lot of people are going to have this mentality. It's going to be a lot of off-season you know, chatter based on the excitement we saw at the beginning of this year. But I almost feel worse about Colorado this season than I did coming into the season, if that makes sense. So coming into the season, my expectation, rough year. It's going to be a re rebuild year. But year two will be the year you see the big turnaround. I feel worse about them now, even though they did have those four wins early in the season because of some of the things you're seeing the way Dion has handled, I mean, just coaching X and O's, clock management throughout the season, the way he's handled the adversity, the way that we kind of predicted there was going to be a staff exodus. By the way, Tim Brewster now resigns. He was one of his better recruiters, one of the guys with more experience than most on his staff. I think you're going to lose Sean Lewis. We talked about that, the offensive play caller. Now you're starting to see recruits. They just lost a big recruit uh, over the weekend. I am not so sold. I think this might just be more chaos. Now, I think it'll be more than four wins because it should be a little bit easier path in the new Big 12, but I am selling Colorado's year two big turnaround competing for the Big 12 championship. I don't want to say stuff that's clippable um, in November with us not knowing what they're going to get or not get in the portal. Uh, but what I did no, what I did say <laughs> what I did say preseason was that we really don't know if Dion can coach. And I got a lot of blowback for that. But they had such a talent advantage in the SWAC 
that they rarely had to play close games in which you had to make difficult decisions, right? Now, they choked away the the uh, the, the bowl game against uh, South, South Carolina State the one year pretty bad, and it looked pretty outcoached in both those games, honestly. But we didn't really know. And Dion, from a game management perspective, uh, quite frankly, was a disaster several times. So he can improve in that. Like, there's nothing intrinsic about Dion that says he has to keep making bad decisions in close games. Right, he. It was also his first year at, at like an actually competitive level with equal or lesser players. So I'm open to the idea that Dion can get better as a game manager. Like guys can get better as you can kind of go to go to analytics school, right? And and just you can learn. hire somebody to take that position. Yeah. that does yeah. it. So why, why, why can't he get a little better at that? Um, now they did lose superstar quarterback recruit Antoine Hill. That commitment lasted five weeks. I, I wonder if some guys aren't using Dion to like get their, you know, raise their own score up and then, and then they bounce to more of a real program. Um, I I think that's probably, probably a thing. His, his tone has totally changed too. Uh, Two weeks ago, it was, we're not an ATM. Yesterday it was, we, we, we need money. These good players cost money, right? Preseason. Hey, I'm bringing in the Louie. Now it's, I, I I know all the holes on his roster. I, I, I know all of our deficiencies. So maybe some realism setting in. Last to say, too, if we look back and you look at Colorado's, like, obviously, great start to the season, a lot of excitement. None of the four teams Colorado beat this year are going to a bowl game. Yeah. TCU finished five and seven. Nebraska finished five and seven. Colorado State's five and seven. And Arizona State was what, three and nine? Mm -hmm. But they kept it close with USC. Mm hmm. And covered. Finished well below expectations, too. And covered against Arizona. Yeah, that, that, that might be their best well, game. I mean, that's that's the thing. They exceeded expectations because the win total was three and a half. It's just those first three wins because it was against a TCU team that literally had played in the title game last year, a Nebraska team that's Nebraska, just really raised expectations for what the rest of the season was going to be to a ridiculous, completely unattainable level. Do they win more games next year? What's the schedule? Have you, you seen the schedule? The schedule is not nice. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's North Dakota State to open. That's tough. I would. I think North Dakota State would beat them this year, at at Nebraska. Look, I would expect Nebraska to have a nice year in the transfer portal. Like you know, my thoughts on, on the Satterfield offensive coordinator hire and his track record, but I still think Nebraska will be an improved football team next year. At Colorado State, at Arizona, host Utah, which. I think we'll have all 11 back on offense, starter-wise. Uh, host Baylor, host Oklahoma State, host Kansas State, uh, Cincinnati, at Kansas, at Texas Tech, at UCF. It'll be curious to see what their win total is. That's tough. Four and a half? Right. Well, it was, what, four and a half this year, and then some places it was three and a half. We had five and a half. That was, that was this year when they had Stanford and Arizona State. Yeah, you know, like that's tough. And you Colorado some, State coming off a two-win year, right? Yeah, so, you had some bottom bottom feeders that aren't there uh, on that Big Twelve schedule. That's tough. telling you, I'm it'll selling be, the year two. To watch. I'm selling the year two turnaround for Colorado. Last one. Uh, when I'm does the selling. Show come out? What's that? When, when does the show come out? Oh, <laughs> they, the the Amazon one. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, we'll have to see. I can't wait to see that. Uh, last sell quickly. I'm selling coaches running out in the field like they're still playing. Uh, we see Dabo do it, right? We see him come running down that hill. It's going to be a disaster waiting to happen, and you guys know where I'm going because Brent Venables is in the tunnel. There's smoke everywhere. You can't see anything. He goes down. I legit think he almost died. I am so like, you need to, all these coaches need to stop. We've seen people get trampled before at sporting events, just not the head coach. You need to be careful. Stay out of there. You guys aren't players anymore. Or you're going to end up like Mufasa in The Lion King when you get trampled by the herd. If you look at some of the angles, you can see the pileup of players. Like, they're all falling on top of him. They're just trying to get out to the field. Coaches, let the players go, and then just do, like, kind of an intimidating walkout with a game face on. Go Kirk Ferentz on him. Just go old school. Stop trying to run out with the players. You ain't playing no more. That's it. Market closed. Lynn saw that video last night and she was like, was this a bit? Was this, was this real? <laughs> so good. Uh, coming up on the other side, more of our thoughts coming out of a very busy rivalry weekend. It's upon further review. Next.
back here on the Cover 3 podcast every single Monday. Look, we know we can't get to everything. We did give you a one hour and 45 minute instant reaction show on Saturday night, <laughs> but we still didn't get to everything. So we go under the hood with a pun for the review. There were terrible calls. Do you want to go ahead and jump in? After further review. After further review. After further review. I'm going to go ahead and get things started with. A, I'm going to take my big old gallon size hat. And I'm going to tip it in the direction of the Texas Longhorns and specifically in the direction of Steve Sarkeesian. Because on the list of, you know, whether it was a fact that was used to make a real argument, whether it was just, you know, running, running my mouth or somebody else doing the same, the old seven win Sark from the Washington days had never, as a head coach, won 10 games. He had always topped out at nine. That was the best season that he had as a head coach in terms of wins and losses was nine and four in 2014 with a USC team that finished number 20 in the AP poll. Steve Sarkeesian in thumping Texas Tech in the regular season finale is 11 and one in the regular season and has just delivered the Longhorns first 11 win regular season since 2009 when they would go on to play for the national championship. We do a lot of, you know, trying to talk about Texas and whether or not they're back or not and adjusting them on the back meter, all the different head coaches that have come through there, you know, whether it was first, you know, Charlie Strong, Tom Herman, now Steve Sarkeesian. It has been Sark who has led Texas to the closest thing that we can say to back that Texas has seen since Colt McCoy got injured in the BCS National Championship game by Marcel Darius and Alabama. So this is, as we go into the Big 12 Championship game, and certainly if Texas is able to get the job done against the Cowboys in the Big 12 Championship game, this is when I'm finally able to say, yes, this is when we can say Texas is back. You know what you just did, don't you? I cursed them to lose. Oklahoma State is winning the Big 12 now. You really just... You got to get in. Up. Hey, give people their flowers when you can. All right. But That's do true. not hedge. Chip just guaranteed you a whole lot of money right now. He called Texas back ahead of the Big 12 mm -hmm. championship when they're still alive for a playoff berth. You're, you are a cursed man, sir. <laughs> I think they take care of business. Yeah, so do I. But <laughs> yeah. I mean, this. Like this, and you consider the injury to Quinn Ewers in the middle of the season. You had to play a couple games with your backup quarterback. Um, Jonathan Brooks, your star running back, goes down with an injury. Like this Texas team has had to overcome real adversity and mm -hmm. win some close games where they have not looked great. I just I am adjusting my personal Steve Sarkeesian grading scale because I think he's done a good job recruiting, developing, and getting this team ready for Saturdays because this is something that for all those coaches that have come through there, that program with so many resources in the state with so much talent, he's the only one since 2009 to get Texas to this spot. We say recruiting is the most important thing at those 18 jobs that can actually win a national title. And I do think that's true, but like Texas has recruited well for about two decades and, and, and Sark is putting together the best season that they've had in that span. So yeah, a, a nice job. Like they, honestly, but like, let's go back to the preseason. Everybody bagged on them so hard, but they were just reverse Texas Tech in, in terms of close game luck last year. Mm -hmm. Like, there's not much skill in winning close games, guys. Like, you can lose them if you make really bad coaching decisions, but I, I think there were just some kind of, you know, some bad variants there. Honestly, um, you know, and they're they're playing better this year as well. Yeah, I, I think too. Like you've seen in previous years where. Texas would have the huge win early in the year, like whether it was, you know, beating Notre Dame or like this year, obviously beating Alabama. And then they lose the Oklahoma game. And it's like, once the air gets let out of the balloon, they have had real problems like refilling it and keeping it going. And I think part of it, like, yeah, obviously recruiting great talent is another thing too. But like when we've seen the clips of it too, like when you talk about building a culture within your locker room, it's like, okay, we lost, we keep going. 
it's not over. We've still got everything to play for. You keep everybody focused. You keep everybody pulling the same direction. And I think that's what's happening. Like you're saying, Chip, the adversity of losing to Oklahoma, then losing Jonathan Brooks and losing guys as the Quinn Ewers going down. You know, it's they've been able to just deal with whatever obstacle is thrown their way and overcome it. And I think that's a great thing. And it's a testament to Sark, who I think, you know, early on in his career, when he was at Washington and USC, had trouble overcoming those obstacles. And I think his time at Alabama and Saban's staff has helped him with that. And I also think getting stuff in order off the field has mm -hmm. been good for him in that aspect. So this is a Texas spot. We're going in no matter what happens this week or what happens, you know, with the possible playoff. I think if you're a Texas fan, you're going into this offseason feeling better about your program than you have in a very long time. And you should. Arch Manning, Arch Manning, Arch Manning, Arch Manning. Manning. Yeah, Arch Manning. All right, uh, one one other note here, uh, but then I'll, uh, I'll let y'all jump in. Twelve bowl teams for the Sun Belt. Yep. I really don't think a lot of college football fans, including members of our own staff, were totally aware that twelve of the fourteen teams, and that includes James the entire Madison, East Division, <laughs> yeah, James Madison, bowl eligible because there were not enough six and six bowl eligible teams to get in bowl eligibility now extends to James Madison, of course, from the Sun Belt East. It now extends to Jacksonville state from conference USA. And then we've got one, right? One five and seven APR team. Minnesota. Minnesota if they choose it, does that sound right? Mm -hmm. I'm looking mm -hmm. at, uh, I'm looking at the, you know, the logo from our friends at, uh, at bowl season on Twitter at bowl season. So it's the Georgia state Panthers, Georgia Southern Eagles, the Troy Trojans, coastal Carolina, Chanticleers, Texas state in year one with GJ Kenny bowl eligible app state bowl eligible, Arkansas state, Butch Jones getting the brick red by board. brick, brick by brick, the bowl eligibility. Kane Womack, who we mentioned earlier, gets South Alabama back to bowl eligibility. Ricky Ronnie has ODU bowl eligible. Uh, Louisiana bowl eligible. Marshall. Bowl, Marshall looked down bad at times yes. this year. <laughs> but man, Charles Huff put the things back together and uh, they finish with bowl eligibility in James Madison as well. Uh, we have discussed the Sun Belt in upon further review in instant reaction shows about how much fun that league has been to um, follow this year, just with the competitiveness, how many different teams it felt like were competent. And I, I look at this and while I do not think all 12 are my favorite teams that I've always loved to be supporting, I do want to give, um, you know, credit to the conference and all those coaches for being able to, uh, to survive a challenging year, a very competitive year, and, uh, and get to this this remarkable total of 12 bowl teams from one conference. You know who deserves a ton of credit for this? Georgia Southern, because Georgia Southern got to 6-2 and two and then said, you know what? I'm going to give out this bowl game. Yeah. We are going to lose our last four games. Texas State, you're going to a bowl. Marshall, you're going to a bowl. Old Dominion, you're going to a bowl. App State, you were already there. But without Georgia total, Southern, total there's only effort. nine bowl teams. This is true. <laughs> I mean, don't rat each other out. Listen, Big Ten, <laughs> take note. This is how you help each other and grow as a conference. I mean, mm -hmm. Big Ten is sitting there only with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They've only got eight teams bowl eligible. I mean, if we are judging conferences just based on how many bowl eligible teams you have, sorry, Big Ten, like you're you're behind the Sun Belt and you're behind the ACC and you're behind the Big Twelve. That's not how we judge conferences. But no, Sun Belt's best conference in the country. Yeah, Period. Sun Belt. So, congrats to uh, the Fun Belt. Tom, pun further review, where do you want to go? Uh, I will first start by saying that there was a, a thing that occurred to me while I was watching the Florida Florida State Big Ten West game on Saturday night because, like, it was the like the Will Rogers news. I think it came out around the same time. I was trying to sit there. I was trying to figure out like, where's Will Rogers going to go? Where's Will Rogers going to go? And then I'm watching Florida State depend on Tate Rodemaker to keep its college, you know, ACC and college football playoff hopes alive. And I'm wondering if we are going to see a situation in the future in the portal or which programs, like if you're a team that's contending for a national title, like we know it is very hard to keep all your quarterbacks these days in the transfer portal. Because a lot of the guys, when they're not playing, they're getting the hell out and they're going somewhere that they could play. But if you're a Florida State 
you're a Georgia and you have your starter and a Jordan Travis and a Carson Beck, but you're one injury away from being in a very bad situation where you're relying on a guy who, you know, maybe you don't not believe in him, but he's not quite the same guy that you currently have. Like we talked about Texas was able to overcome it because they had tremendous quarterback depth. A guy like Will Rogers enters the portal. He clearly is probably going to want to go somewhere he can start, but he's also played a lot. I don't know what else there is for him to put on tape to prove to the NFL about his future. I think his NFL future is what it already is. So does like he doesn't have one, right? Yeah, or he's like, yeah. you know, he's going to compete as an undrafted free agent for a camp job and maybe a third, whatever. Yeah, bud, we've already talked about this. If poor Tommy DeVito is out there getting snaps, I mean, just look at the backup quarterback. Yeah, Big Ten West is dominating the NFL. Aiden yeah, O'Connell, I, Tommy DeVito. Like we, we think DeVito has, has a little bit better arm strength than Will Rogers, though, yes, right? I mean, yes, like, we do. Yeah, mm-hmm. like DeVito's got some physical talent. He's Will, Will Rogers, I think, is going pro in something other than sports. But, like, so Will Rogers, if I'm Georgia, you know, or Florida State or any, again, Am I going to Will Rogers and offering him a nice hefty sum of money and saying, come be a backup quarterback for us. So that way we have an insurance plan if our guy goes down. And are we going to start seeing the blue blood powerhouse programs that have more of that NIL cash to throw around? If we can't keep the guy we're recruiting, maybe we can buy us a backup in the portal. So it's a really interesting take. I'm glad you brought this up. Um, Do you know who kind of did this last year? I don't think it was NIL, but it, it was with an air raid guy who uh, was, at the time, the FBS leader in passing yards, Jarrett Dagey. Mm-hmm. He went. He lost the job at Western Kentucky, and he went to Troy. And last year, when Gunnar Watson got hurt, Jarrett Dagey had to come in and play a little bit, mm-hmm. right? Like, like, Troy was very fortunate to get him as an experienced backup. I, I think the problem with this, if, if we want to poke holes in it, because it's, it's brilliant if you can pull it off, is that a? I don't know that any team out there has so much nil money that they can throw enough money at someone to come and be a backup compared to what they would get to be able to like go somewhere and play, mm-hmm. right? Like this year, the quarterback market in the portal is not going to be very good, right? Like, like how many how many big time guys are are hopping in the portal? Like I assume Gabriel will because I don't think he's an NFL guy. Childs, right? Riley Leonard, Charles Riley, <laughs> Riley Leonard. I, I I think DJU. If Pratt doesn't turn pro, obviously, like that, that that'll be one that people will 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 discuss again. Tyler Van Dyke, I assume, won't stay at Miami. That's just an assumption. Nope, nothing official there. Max Johnson's in, but not a lot of these guys are like, oh yeah, that's a guy you have to go get. And there are a lot of teams that are going to need one. Like I think NC State's going to need one because if you think Morris is really going to stay there, I, I'm no, I'm not I'm not buying no. into that at all. Uh, d- despite what they were saying, maybe I'm wrong. So. I mean, just the team that's going to need a guy to come in and start is just always going to pay more than a team that wants a guy to come in and be a backup. I guess. But I'm not. I I don't. I don't think you have to limit it to Power Five guys though, because I'll I'll point to Illinois. Like John Paddock was a longtime starter at Ball State. He's not a five star, gonna you know whatever, but he's a very solid floor kind of backup to have. So you go to the G five route, the guy who you know like. Brett Gabbert, if he has any eligibility, I don't think he does, but we saw Gabbert enter the portal last year and he ended up going back to Miami. Guys like that who have plenty of experience who maybe you'd feel more comfortable handing the keys to than the freshman who's been on campus for eight months and hasn't taken a snap in a game that mattered in his life. That, that's a good point, uh, for sure. I, what really helps push us over the line is if the guy is not an NFL talent, but he wants to get into coaching. Mm-hmm. You're able to sell like, hey, come here. Here's a little bit of NIL money for you. Work on your grad degree. Be our backup. If something happens, <clears throat> then you're our starter. Congrats. Uh, but also, like, learn about coaching. Wink, wink. There's probably a GA spot for you here when you're done. Yeah, that was uh, – that's, like, Clemson's only portal action. Mm-hmm. It's bringing right. in, like, a Hunter Johnson or a Paul Tyson, you know. Uh, exactly. Sure. Gardner Minshew to Alabama. Yeah. Uh, before yep. before he went back before to, he went to Wazoo. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Tom, is this last one from you too? Yeah. Although that coward Daniel Cannell ran away, so Bud's gonna have oh. to take the heat for this one. You guys Not are nuts. Trend, Danny. dipping, Danny, just dipping out. Yeah. You two are nuts. I know Danny started it by saying UCLA would beat Penn State, but I saw you tweeting. Somebody tweeted you about it, and you said if Ethan Garber started, you'd give him a chance. There is no way in the world UCLA is beating Penn State. We talked about Colorado's resume looking back in hindsight. 
go look at the teams UCLA has beaten this year. Like the USC win is good, but other than that, they beat up on a lot of bad teams. Penn State's only two losses this year were by eight on the road at Ohio State and by nine to Michigan. They kicked everybody else's ass. They would kick UCLA's ass too. And I, look, I, I would favor Penn State. And I, I didn't start this, but like and look through the power ratings, UCLA with Garbers to me is not that much different than what Penn State is. They both have a boatload of talent on defense. Like they're both going to have, you know, first or second round NFL edge rushers. They both have draftable players on the interior defensive line. They both have kind of suspect offensive lines. They both have quarterbacks who are kind of sketchy. I think Penn State is a better I don't think Aller's sketchy. I think Aller's been really good in every game that wasn't Penn State or Michigan or Ohio right. State or Michigan. UCLA offensive coaching advantage. Yes. Agreed. Yes. Okay, like potentially big. Uh, receiver both has been a little bit disappointing, I think, this year. There, that's probably a wash there. Penn State's got better backs, but it's not like UCLA's backs suck. I, I just think this would be a low-scoring defensive battle that that like nobody would really pull away from each other if they have Garbers. But like Moore was pretty disappointing to me this year, and Schley really has not been able to play. Like when Garbers was in there, that was a pretty decent team, and you saw it against Cal. Like as soon as he got hurt, it's like oh, this is done. They're they're screwed. Penn State by twenty-one. What would you really make it like, like with with Garbers in? Uh, seven to ten. Okay, so you think Penn State's like a 20 and UCLA is like, like a 12? Yeah, yeah. I mean, UCLA mm -hmm. shouldn't be higher than a 14. No. Yeah. They, yeah. Their, yeah. their offense at no point this season it has shown that they are worth being in that caliber where, to me, when you are above, in, when you're in the 14 to 20 range, you have some balance, right? You're not just totally one-sided, especially when it, if your one side that's good is the side that is defense and your side that is not good is the one that's responsible for putting points on the scoreboard. Thankfully, thanks to Kevin Warren, we will now get to see this regularly. <laughs> yes, we will. <laughs> um, Justin Wilcox, by the way, six and six. Mm -hmm. Did not <laughs> Cal won its final three games of the year to reach bowl eligibility. So I will say, like that that I'm happy you mentioned that because I completely did. Justin Wilcox continues to do a very good job at a place that is very hard to win and you don't really get a whole lot of support. And he just keeps putting it together and winning games. And I don't know, man. We'll see. We'll see if somebody ever kind of wises up to that. Well, it's the ACC era now for the Cal Bears, closing it out with a uh... – Maybe Duke should hire Justin Wilcox. <laughs> hey. We got we got a lot of uh, we we got a lot of time to be able to continue to spin that forward, and we will be back Tuesday night. Oh, thank God! There's just one of these left. All right, there's one more Tuesday night release of the new college football playoff rankings. And look, we will be reacting mainly to as what I think is where is Ohio State? Where do the Buckeyes fall in the the ranking of the one loss teams? Because that will let us know how much chaos needs to unfold on championship Saturday for the Buckeyes for a second year in a row to not play on championship Saturday and then find their way into the college football playoff. So we'll have that information. We can break down all of those scenarios. Uh, the rest of it, now it's just kind of letting it play out on the field. So Tuesday, about 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. We might get started a, a few minutes early, depending on how quickly the rankings come out. Then after that, Wednesday, a championship week edition of big game breakdown going inside the matchup of, you know, Alabama and Georgia, Oregon and Washington. What needs to happen for Florida state as they look to improve uh, from that result against from that result against Florida, as they look at the Louisville so much more championship locks on Thursday. Championship week, boys. Good you man. can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernell. You can follow him at Bud Elliott three. You can follow me at chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. See y'all.